Hi, I'm Leon Gorin, president of PEO Leadership, a peer-to-peer -peer leadership advisory firm. We're an amazing community of CEOs, presidents, and senior executives. Ask yourself, are you learning as fast as the world is changing? It's time for Ontario business leaders to band together for counsel and support. It's time for you to tap into the business wisdom of our peer groups and unlock new ways to grow. I want you to come out of this COVID crisis a better leader and your organization ready for what's next. Take the first step at peo-leadership.com. What you're going to experience this morning is one of our many PEO community events where we invite various thought leaders from around the world to join us to discuss some opportunities and challenge, challenges our members are facing. These community events represent one leg of a three-legged stool in our promise to help leaders realize their goals and objectives for themselves and their organizations. The other two legs are a little bit more intimate in terms of their fewer numbers. But the first leg really is about defining success for every leader that participates in our community. And that's not just about the business, it includes both their health, family, career, and today's session really about their wealth and sort of defining what success looks like, understanding where they are today. And our job is really to enable them and try and get them from A to point B and keep them focused in a straight line. And then the second leg in sort of delivering our promise is putting these members into advisory boards facilitated by that same executive advisor who works on the roadmap with those individuals and ensuring that the door is closed in those advisory boards and the conversation is both meaningful, challenging, and really objective. So you can really get to the meat of some of these issues and opportunities these leaders are facing. We all understand that leadership can be extremely lonely, especially in a rapidly changing business landscape where you need to be agile and decisive. If you're operating on your own, you're really operating at a disadvantage. And to be successful in today's world, it's all about pushing your leadership capabilities, your learnings and constant working to build up the right connections. At PO Leadership, our members include some of Canada's strongest leaders among representing almost every industry. They lead both Canadian SMEs and large multinational organizations. And we have some of the world's best executive advisors working with them. And of course, I think we have some of the best connections in the world. Our leaders understand the value and importance of being able to connect and think with each other as they work to successfully achieve those personal goals and those of their organization. After today's session, take a moment. If you're interested, you can reach out to me or you can just visit our site at www.po-leadership.com. So we're about to get our session underway here. And uh, I just want to go through some of the logistics here. I'm getting a couple of audio fine here. Okay, I'm just noticing as, uh, as I'm talking logistics, whether people can hear me, but I think people can hear me. Dane, you can hear me? Yes. Okay, good. I'm just watching the, the chat side. Yeah. So what we're gonna do, Thane and I are gonna kick off this fire set chat here for about 20 to 25 minutes. I've got a number of questions for him. And then I'm gonna open it up for Q&A for the rest of the group here. And you're all on mute right now, but as you post your questions in the group chat, what we'll do is we'll keep an eye on them and I may call on you by um, telling you to come off mute and to sort of pull, to ask Thane directly the question. So I think we're ready to go. Um, our guest today, which I just called him out, is Thane Stenner. I've known Thane for many years. Uh, he's a fellow Canadian. He was born and raised in Vancouver. And now he's, he's based in downtown San Francisco. Uh, he's the managing director of Stenner's only group of Greystone Consulting of Morgan Stanley. I think Morgan Stanley re released results, by the way, in the last two days. We can talk about that too, Thane. Um, sure. <laughs> no, their group manages 20 billion US in assets and has been ranked number one in California based on Barron's top 50 advisor list in 2020. His clients tend to have a net worth between 50 and million and 6 billion. And of course, Thane is chairman emeritus of Tiger 21 as he started the organization just, I think it was about 10 years ago here. He's been in the market advising clients for over 33 years, and his father was also in the investment business. And uh, what's really fascinating is Sir John Templeton was one of his many, one of his many mentors in his early teens. So Thane, thank you for joining us today. It's awesome Absolute. to have you here. Absolute pleasure to join. Thank you. So, you know, we, we sort of went out with the topic about this whole dislocation around the market, 
and the economy. And, and it's really a lot that we've been seeing within our own members, right? We're watching these businesses go and it's giving us a sense of the economy. And then we're watching these markets go up, up and away. There's nothing stopping these things. So I thought we'd even just start by laying some foundation. And I, I broke it into two parts, you know, giving us a sense of what your perspective is on the economy and then give us the foundation of a little bit on the, on the market as well. So Thane. Okay. Well, thank you. Thanks. Thank you once again. And uh, I tend to, when I present it, I tend to do things in pretty rapid, rapid fire uh, format. So uh, hopefully that'll work for everybody. So first six months of the year um, basically has been uh, extremely challenging as we all know. And in fact, uh, Q2, uh, showed according to the Atlanta Fed uh, to be down almost 50% on an annualized basis in uh, GDP. So uh, we hadn't had not seen numbers like that until uh, the Great Depression back in the 1930s. So uh, the understatement uh, I would say is that things have been very challenging, uh, obviously caused by COVID. Um, as far as the economic numbers that we're seeing now, you've, you've heard lots of different commentary around, you know, is this a B or a W or a U or an L? And uh, Leon and I were sharing this prior to starting. The latest I've heard, uh, the latest I've heard is the leaning, uh, leaning Y uh, to the right, where the top part of the Y is the stock market, kind of uh, rapidly rising like it has. Uh, since the lows in March and uh, the low low prong, which was in essence uh, currently still the economy. So what we've just gone through in essence has been the fastest bear market in history. Uh, it was down in, in Toronto around 37% from peak to low. Um, and the U.S. market was down roughly 35% during that period. And then we've seen the fastest recovery uh, roughly up over 44% in both cases. So uh, to say things have been volatile would be a massive understatement. So that's kind of what I'd begin with. No, oh, thank you, Thane. It, it's interesting. Um, I'm going to jump right into it. I mean, in terms of seeing something like this before, historically, have you? do we have anything to compare this to? Hmm. Not really, because uh, the great, you know, if you go back to, um, you know, the terrorist attacks, for example, in 2001, um, you know, that was a sudden event in a regional area that affected, but normalcy came back, you know, fairly quickly over a six month time frame. Um, the great recession that occurred from you know, 2008 to 2010, um, occurred, but it was also caused by, you know, an over leveraged uh, uh, banking or mortgage system. In this situation, all economies everywhere have been affected by this COVID situation. So um, in my career of 33 years, I've not seen anything even close to this uh, from a perspective of the impact on everything and all at once. Uh, so uh, no, I don't think we've seen anything like this before. So when you think about, and I'm coming back, you know, the market popping back so quickly. The other thing that's kind of new is the amount of fiscal and monetary policy here that all the governments have just been pumping money into this, into the system here. I mean, how much does that play into it? I mean, is that, I mean, could that make it sustainable? And there really isn't a dislocation, there's a dislocation, but it's not really a dislocation. Yeah, so, you know, as a reminder, obviously the stock markets and the fixed income markets, for that matter, are leading indicators. They tend to move in advance um, of the underlying economy. And that started to take place on February 19th was the peak, and the low was March 23rd. So prior to the recessionary numbers confirming that, you know, the markets had already declined, you know, over a third um, prior to us, you know, seeing the economic data come out here. Uh, and confirmed over the last few months. So uh, the markets, in my opinion, uh, you know, because of the flood of cash uh, printed by central banks around the world, I think have created another bubble, basically in the equity markets. Uh, and for that matter, uh, likely the fixed income markets based upon where the yields are today. So, um, you know, in context, uh, the US 
um, I'm based here in San Francisco. Uh, the U.S. has printed, uh, in essence, the equivalent on the currency of an extra 25 percent in, in the course of the last three to four months. So that's rushed into the equity markets. The, the, the Fed uh, is buying corporate bonds, which is trying to stabilize the system. And you know, in fact, at some point, they may even, if they need to, uh, buy uh, equities like Japan has um, in, in previous circumstances. So personally and professionally, I guess my comment would be that um, I do believe that the equity markets have uh, gotten ahead of themselves currently based upon what we're seeing currently in the underlying economy and the stats we're seeing even literally in the last few weeks. Uh, I can talk more about that in a bit. Yeah. So when, when you say the, ahead of, you know, ahead of itself, how, how far ahead of itself do you think this is? Well, it, yes. Great question. Great question. So historically, historically, the equity markets are a leading indicator by anywhere from six to 12 months. So how can I quantify that? A lot of analysts and a lot of uh, strategists are commenting now at the, they're, they're justifying existing equity prices uh, based upon going out all the way out to 2022 earnings, which is fascinating because, you know, roughly half the companies uh, have deferred, you know, uh, guidance on their earnings over the course of the next 12 months. So trying to, you know, digest or, or, or prognosticate based upon something that's two to three years out um, is quite fascinating. Normally, normally the equity markets are looking out six to 12 months and are a discounting uh, mechanism towards that. So um, this is one of the reasons why I think a lot of the good news of the potential recovery uh, has already been baked into prices. Currently. And what do, you, what, what do you think about, there's talk about, you know, a few companies sort of driving the markets here, right? So especially the technology and the disruptive innovation and, and when you look at some of them, be the Teslas or, you know, the Amazon, get it. They're going to be here. They're going to be mammoths in the future. Um, but they are certainly, is it true that a lot of those are driving the actual market, the S&P and the Dow and the NASDAQ to these heights? And, the, and there are a lot of companies out there that are really not moving in the same, at the same pace. So just to give you some stats, this is a great point. You've got... Uh, in essence, the heavy lifting of the equity markets right now by you know, the top five to 10 tech, tech companies. And we all know what they are, the fangs or fangs, uh, it depends on you know, how you want to call it, the Facebook, Alphabet, Amazon, uh, Apple, uh, Microsoft are, are the heavy lifters today. Um, so just to give you some stats, year to date, the underlying uh, tech uh, so basically, the, those names are up roughly 35% uh, or so year to date. And the underlying S&P uh, is basically slightly negative. So what that really means is the other 495 names in the S&P 500 are uh, still in negative territory year to date. So uh, that's how much of a bifurcated market it is. The last time this occurred was in the dot-com period. And the top five names then made up roughly uh, 16 to 17% of the S&P 500 market cap. Today, the top five names make up roughly 25% of the S&P 500. So five names lifting the, basically the full market. So historically, if you look back through the last 100 years, whenever you've got a high degree of concentration of just a few companies, uh, really driving the market. That tends to be a period of time in which you want to be uh, much more defensive and a lot more cautious uh, with equity allocations. So I hear what you're saying, but I mean, we were talking about that a year ago as well, right? We were always talking about these tech companies are flying uh, and they've continued to fly through, through this period. And if you weren't in them, you really got hurt badly. And so you know, you sit here today and you go, can you afford not to be in the Apples, the Amazons and the Teslas today? Because 
there's some people like Kathy Woods, you take Tesla, her, her best bet is 15,000 US by 2024. So, yeah. So there's no doubt that COVID has brought forward and accelerated everything online communications wise. So there's no doubt about it. But I'm also reminded by, you know, uh, some quotes of, you know, John Templeton or, or uh, Warren Buffett where they talk about you can have a great company, you can buy a great company, but you, got, you can also overpay for that company. So the, the price earnings multiples and the, the price per sales multiples of the tech companies today are baking in a lot of good news. I mean, uh, you know, just some of these, uh, you know, Zoom, for example, we're on Zoom today. Yeah. Um, uh, fortunately, made a little bit of money on Zoom here this last year, but you know, Zoom is trading like over a hundred times uh, revenues currently. Just to give you some, some context around that, so so you can have these great companies like Apple, um, but the price that you pay for them uh, does matter over a period of time. So, you know, interestingly, um, even you know uh, Warren Buffett on, on Berkshire on their public equity allocations today, um, Apple has soared and currently makes up 25% of Berkshire's public portion of their portfolio. A lot of people don't know this, but they've got about 90 businesses within Berkshire, of which roughly 50 are publicly traded. So out of the public portion, Apple has, has zoomed ahead, uh, pun intended. So I think, you know, again, price paid matters over time. And if you're, if you're a mid to long-term investor, uh, you can end up owning a great company, but if you overpay for it, you can end up with uh, disappointing results all the time. So we know even in our audience that a lot of people are holding a lot of cash and a lot of the smart investors. It's actually one of the reasons I wanted to, to have this conversation with you because I'm worried like all our leaders, they work so hard building value in their business for years. The executives are putting money in their RSPs. They're saving their money. And now we're in a situation where you take Apple for example, it's it's unbelievable the rise in Apple, right? Buffett's sitting, he's not really buying stuff. Does Buffett sell Apple right now to, because he thinks it's overvalued? Like, and, um, and this probably relates to our, our, those in the room here as well. Like, do we start selling stuff or do we not really care? Like it should be just a long-term hold and leave it alone. So first of all, I would consider myself a long-term optimist. And um, I keep reminding myself that, of that today because um, at times of more speculative periods, like what I believe today is, um, you have to remind yourself that, you know, even though there may be some pain coming on the equity markets, um, you know, be ready to try to take advantage of that. So when it comes to cash, for example, what people say versus what people do, uh, there's a big difference. So Warren Buffett does not consider himself uh, to be a market timer per se. And a lot of people have challenged him by saying he missed the boat on the March lows and didn't really deploy. In fact, he was a net seller during that period. He ended up selling out of a lot of the airline companies as one example. But you know, I, I've been a Berkshire shareholder for about 30 years myself. I've you know, studied his annual reports going back the last you know, 55, 56 years since he's a public, publicly traded uh, company. And currently right now, he is around 30% cash. So. He says he's not a market timer, but I, you know, I've studied his cash positions over time. This is number one, by far his highest ever period in percentage, not just dollar, but percentage wise of the enterprise value of Berkshire Hathaway that he's ever been. The previous high that he ever got to was roughly 19% cash. Uh, and that happened to be uh, in that, uh, 2007 prior to the last recession. So, so, so somehow he seems to have a knack of being cashed up or significantly cash, cashed up before uh, accidents happen. So um, currently he's over 30% cash. He just did announce the $9.7 billion acquisition in the midstream energy space here in the last two weeks. Um, and I, again, I, I would say that there is some good value in the, in the commodities area still, um, but he's not, he seems to not be in a rush to deploy capital. And when he was challenged at his uh, streamed Berkshire uh, EGM back a few months ago, 
he was challenged by saying, well, how come you didn't pounce on things when the markets were down 33%? His simple answer was early days. So really what he's saying, he, and my, my takeaway from reading and how he communicates is the fact that he thinks we're going to be in for a, a more prolonged, challenging recovery period. So, so he's, uh, he's doing you know, what he feels is best, and that is keeping a, a lot of cash on the sidelines. And, and at some point, I think he'll be extremely opportunistic um, and step into things. But um, So cash amongst your members, I think, is wise. Um, the regrettable thing though is, you know, this is probably one of the most challenging, in fact, I, I would say it is the most challenging period of time in my career to be deploying capital. Uh, interest rates are basically almost zero. I mean, for all intents and purposes in the U S the treasury rate is 0.12 or 1% uh, this week. Uh, the 10 year bond yield was 0.64 or 1%. Uh, so, I mean, for the fixed income investor or, or for the investor that's looking to try to park money even um, on, a, on an after-tax, after-inflation basis, you're actually getting a negative rate of return right now. So to those people, I would be uh, suggesting the following. With cash, I'd be applying as much as possible towards debt. Um, because one, one of the things we haven't talked about is the amount of you know, debt in the system. And this is an area where uh, we have a lot of concerns currently, but in essence, if you can reduce the debt on your personal balance sheet as well as your corporate balance sheet, um, to me, that's actually a, a good thing to do at this point of the overall market cycle. So I'll stop that's there. Interesting because you, you got like Bank of Canada last week comes on, he goes, we're holding at 0.25 and don't expect us to increase it. And so you're running a business and you yep. sit there and go, that is nothing like that's zero essentially. Right. Yeah. Why wouldn't I borrow money now at no cost and really start to invest in the business? And, um, so, so yes, if you're borrowing now, and I would say borrowing as long out as possible, what I'm, what I'm seeing with significant business owners is that's exactly what they're doing. But what I'm trying to you know, stress here is if your personal balance sheet is a bit stretched, I'd be trying to, you know, shore that up as much as possible uh, just to make sure you're in a strong position personally. Because one of the things entrepreneurs always know is if your personal uh, household scenario isn't uh, as strong, it, it puts a lot of pressure on you and your business. So I guess maybe I should have differentiated that a little bit more and said, you know, from a perspective of your personal balance sheet, just trying to make sure you're, um, you know, you're not as levered uh, as, as your business may be. So let's push on with the, the debt conversation because yeah. it leads to, you know, conversation deflation versus inflation. Um, you know, in terms of what are we, when you put that much money into the markets that the feds are doing today, actually every government's doing, at some point in time, you think it's going to drive some type of inflation. Um, we don't feel that right now in terms of at least we're not measuring it maybe we're measuring inflation incorrectly i don't know but we're not necessarily feeling what are you seeing or what do you what do you think yeah so, so this is a big debate that's going on uh, even within morgan stanley i mean the the uh global investment committee is debating this every week as to uh, what's showing up so interestingly for the first time in a long time uh morgan stanley is actually uh suggesting an allocation of commodities, uh, which they began about uh, six weeks ago. That was the first time that they actually really, uh, you know, suggested a meaningful position. And that was around, you know, they also have tips and some other commodity or inflation related things. But basically what they're saying is next 12 months, economically, for the most part, is still in a deflationary cycle. And then heading into, you know, mid 2021 and beyond we do think that inflation is actually going to start to uh rear its uh its its head during that period of time so um you know lots of debate around deflation stagflation inflation um you know i don't know i was on a blackrock uh, call last week for example and one of the things that one of the markers that just 
was released in the last week, um, meat for restaurants, for example, has spiked over 40% in price in the last six weeks. So, you know, there's different different areas of inflation that, that are starting to show up, but, you know, for the broader sense, you've got oil, you know, which uh, has historically made up uh, gas, it made up a pretty significant portion of CPI, uh, has rallied. Uh, we think it's um, probably overdone and we'll probably settle back down a little bit here. Um, but I think at some point with the amount of funds that have been printed uh, to support the global system, inflation will be an issue. And uh, I just think it's a bit early, but I do think it is coming. Um, and you know, it's probably through a valley here over the course of the next 12 months. Well, it's interesting because I was on a call with you when we, they did the Tiger 21 Summit. They had four speakers, right? Very well-known speakers. Yep. You interviewed one of them. Yes. Uh, and I'll even add David Rosenberg. I've been reading his stuff. And But three out of the four speakers there said, I hate gold, but yet I'm buying gold right now. And what's that about it? I mean, what, what are they doing here? It's, well, ba basically the, the market. So, you know, we've fortunately participated in, in gold and gold miners for the last 18 months. we are kind of more deep value and contrarian thinking the way we do things. Gold and gold miners 18 months ago were dogs. They had come down from the 2000 peaks. They were down 80% uh, on the gold miner side. So it was a, an area that a contrarian uh, deep value stream from the point of view of trying to step into it. So gold basically reflects um, you know, a viewpoint of whether or not currencies are being debased. So with all, and I said earlier, with all the uh, money being printed, I mean, literally the US dollar has increased roughly 25% of its uh, inventory of, of dollars globally has been printed in the last four months. So that is a, that is an inflationary. And, and so gold is starting to reflect that. Uh, there's serious concerns that, you know, at some point inflation will uh, maybe take off and get away from, from, uh, uh, you know, from the central bankers. A lot of people feel like, you know, the central bankers, uh, globally can control fully the markets and, and in essence manipulate the markets. Um, that's true for a period of time, but uh, not all the time. And if you look back through history of different bear markets and the equity markets, for example, um, you know, it's been proven that they've, they've helped at certain points, but then at some point the, the morphine wears off and the markets adjust. So I think in the case of gold, um, you know, we, we have an allocation in gold, uh, right now it's around 7%. Um, and we've participated in gold miners, gold miners though, just for those on the call here, gold mining stocks, this might surprise some of you, but from the March 13th bottom in, in gold miners, not from March 23rd, bottom, March 13th, gold miners have rallied over 130%. So. I would not be chasing it, just to be really clear. I would not be a buyer today of gold mining stocks today. Um, but at some point, if they were to correct, you know, 20 to 30% down from here, I'd be definitely, for, you know, having a portion of the portfolio in gold mining stocks. But as far as gold, the commodity, um, historically, it's been, you know, a 2000 year kind of hedge to a portfolio. So, um, I think it's wise to have some some gold in, in one's portfolio today. Okay, no, that's great. So, you know, we we talked about a little bit of the public market, so a little bit of commodities. I mean, when people look at their assets, need to look at a whole the whole thing, right? Real estate, alternative mm -hmm. investments, public markets typically is maybe could be twenty percent of your entire holdings. What do you think about the other assets? I mean, when you talk to your clients, you've got you look at all types of alternative assets real estate, private equity, are they all high these days too, just like the public markets? Are we gonna have a reckoning there a little bit? Well, yeah, so for example, the bond market is roughly six times larger, seven times larger than the equity markets globally. So the bond market, um, here, here's where the real challenge is, is comp you know, public companies have, gone on a, you know, binge this year, record year from point of view of raising capital in the fixed income markets uh, to kind of survive the COVID situation. Uh, 
governments have gone on a binge. Um, and I would say you know, the COVID and a lot of the programs, the government programs, have deferred uh, the, the issues and the balance sheet issues uh, and debt issues on personal balance sheets. So, I, you know, on the fixed income side, I mean, you know, I, I'd say that the projected and the forecast the rates return on the fixed income are abysmal. Actually, if, we, if you look out over the next five to 10 years from where we are today, you know, the capital market assumption forecast that Morgan Stanley does, GMO, uh, BlackRock, for example, uh, all in the last quarter are projecting out returns that are uh, less than half of what the returns have been over the course of the last 10 years. And when it comes to fixed income, we're actually forecasting a slightly negative return on the fixed income in the next five years. So very challenging period to be trying to find balance you know, in your portfolio. So this is one of the reasons why, as I said earlier, having a higher cash position, at least you don't have principal risk. You have, you have inflation risk, but you don't have principal risk so much as you might have on the fixed income markets. Um, so when it comes to alternative investments, you know, this is an area that um, you know, we spend a lot of time in and allocate a lot of capital to. Uh, there's a lot of different alternative strategies out there uh, that can you know, give you the opportunity set to do better than you know, a lot of the public markets uh, and a lot of the you know, public equity and public uh, fixed income markets going forward. So credit structures, long short structures, um, you know, managed futures, and, and, and you know, a lot of other uh, things. So alternatives for those on the, on the call that are not as familiar with what that means. Alternatives really at the end of the day means anything that's not stocks, bonds, or cash. So whether it's real estate uh, or, or commodities or you know, other, other investment holdings. So I, I would say that you know, when it comes to um, you know, the opportunity set, there are opportunities for sure. Uh, we're finding some today, but I'm, I'm telling you, it's, uh, you have to do a lot more homework and um, you have to kind of scour through a lot more things that, uh, you know, more, that aren't uh, necessarily you know, the common, some of the common things that you may have invested in the last decade. So alternatives do offer, in my opinion, um, you know, a good area to be looking at, but you give up uh, typically liquidity for a lot of those. Um, you know, aside from real estate, um, obviously real estate can be a more liquid asset uh, over time, but you know, not like liquidity from point of view of public markets. Um, I don't even want to go there because if I open the can of worms on real estate here in Toronto, you're going to just make everybody feel very sad. And it's a Friday yeah. we're going into a weekend. Yeah. So, so, so again, so I, I remind everybody I'm a long-term optimist. Um, <laughs> but you know, I, I do find myself today uh today as I'm you know speaking with you but also in general finding um uh myself in a place where you know the next two years the next two years in my opinion is going to be a very slow muted growth recovery. I was just listening to CNBC before I got on here and um you know uh, some of the announcers and some of the you know commentators there were commenting. It's a good word. I think uh you know this this green shoots that we're starting to see a little bit of here. Um, you've got to remember that the stats are showing off an extreme low period. Like we've literally seen the global economies um, tail off. And then what you've got is you've got a few other things to worry about. You've got a U.S. Uh, uh, election coming up. You've got a trade war continuing or a cold war developing between the U.S. and China. These are not good things. Uh, politics aside, that as far as you know, two major trading partners in the world, um, you know, fighting and bickering as they are, um, this is going to cause some problems for us over over time. So, so yes, it is a Friday afternoon now. Uh, we're close <laughs> to it, uh, and I'm trying to remain, uh, you know, as a long-term optimist. But uh, bottom line is, everything we're reading, all the research we're reading from different sources, all the different business people we're talking to on our analyst conference calls and whatnot are basically saying, you know, they've got very little visibility in the next 12 months. The COVID situation, you know, clearly is the, uh, on the front burner. And everything that I'm hearing and seeing and reading is, you know, 
yes, there's some optimism around potential vaccines and trials and tests by the end of the year or early next year. But the reality is, if you talk to most people, uh, most of the tiger groups or different clients we talk to, half of them say that they wouldn't even take the vaccine if there was one, because um, they want to see if it you know, has any serious side, side effects. So, you know, I, I, again, I, I find it very difficult to think that we're going to get back to normal, whatever that new normal looks like, for at least, you know, 18 to 24 months. So I, and I wish, I wish I was more optimistic than that. Um, but I also think that it's uh, important to be a realist and, and to this vibe. That's a great thing. Thank you. Before we head into the Q&A portion of this webcast, first, a brief note about PO leadership from one of our members. What I love about PEO leadership right now is how well our members are supporting each other and rising to face the COVID-19 challenge. Paul Zadorsky, Senior Vice President, Crayola International. Business is all about being able to rapidly adapt to change, but how do you learn as fast as the world changes? PEO leadership lets you tap into the collective wisdom of some of Canada's top executives. Having that peer group and broader leadership community to lean on, it makes all the difference. The time to step up and lead is now. Go to peo-leadership.com. I want to open it up to questions. And so if you guys can put out your questions into the group chat, some of you have put it out in the survey, but even if you can put it up again, and as you are writing, they're, they're flooding in. John, Kustik, I'm going to get you to come off first off uh, mute here. And uh, John is part of Focus Asset Management. He's also an educational partner of PO Leadership. And uh, some of you have heard him speak before. We've had them in the early days of COVID. But John, have you heard anything from Thane that surprises you or... Uh, that you guys are looking at differently? Uh, you know, to be honest, I would say no. I mean, uh, you know, I don't, I, I don't know Thane personally, but I find, uh, you know, I've read a lot of his uh, articles over the years. His thought process uh, is very much aligned with how we think about things. And um, so in general, I would say, you know, I, I really agree with the outlook. It's a, let's face it, we've had massive, you know, liquidity-led market rebounds and um you know given the yes it was a mandated uh, economic shutdown and and obviously we have to reopen over time and we'll slowly recover the economy but given all this backdrop i i, I think it warrants sort of patience and caution as we move forward and um so you know in, in general i would say uh, you know the, the themes that they uh, touched upon i think very much make sense for you know the people listening to the call today that's great thank you john that's good andrew nickel you want to come off mute and uh i know you got a question for us uh sure again uh the question that i just posted in chat had to do with q2 results which we know are are coming out this week and certainly more so next week, and then you know what should trickle through uh, over the, the course of a month. But uh, I guess general expectation would be for fundamental results coming out showing the revenue loss over the past quarter. Uh, my question then uh, is, why have we not seen the market starting to price this in uh, now, given the expectation of these losses coming out? What's propping it up? So, I'll take that, if that's okay. Um, so, one example, Morgan Stanley, uh, in the last 48 hours, came out with record quarterly results, um, and they beat uh, expectations. But you have to realize that the expectations set have been you know, much lower. So it's easy to beat a target if, you're, if the expected target has been reset considerably lower. So, um, and you know, yesterday the, the stock was up, uh, you know, a little bit. So I guess what I would say is the markets have been expecting a recovery off a very low point. Uh, the earnings uh, releases this week have been, you know, for the most part ahead of expectations. Um, but what I'm I'm surmising here is that the some of the smart money, some of the institutional money is actually selling into that strength at this point. So you've already had a 40% plus move upwards in the equity markets from the low. So clearly a lot of the um, you know, investors that got in during that you know, period of time 
are starting to take some profit right now. So I think, you know, I know, and I know it can be a confusing thing, but you know, at the end of the day, you know, what do they say? Um, um, uh, you know, try to buy when things are very unclear and try to sell when you get more clarity. So, you know, I think what you're going to see is you're going to see some profit taking here into a quote unquote, uh, stronger than expected, uh, earnings season. So, uh, that's one of the reasons why, um, you know, the, the stocks, I think, will be a little bit more muted here. You also have seasonality in the equity markets. From here till October, uh, so Q3, uh, tends to be the weakest quarter. Historically, if you look back over the hundred last 100 years, uh, it tends to be you know, people are off on holidays. There's less liquidity in the system. Uh, there's less trading activity in general uh, by a lot of trading desks. So... I think that may also be part of it where people are just going to be uh, reducing the risk positions into, into some strength of uh, quarterly results. That's how I'd answer that. Thanks, Dana. Just a follow on to that, if you guys don't mind, uh, just tying in, you know, one of the Warren Buffett measures, which is productive capacity or GDP to, to market cap. It seems like that has been a, its most divergent we've ever seen. Yes, so I did a presentation two days ago and I used that graphic and that ratio in that presentation. So, so uh, back in the dot-com period, you know, year 2000, 99, 2000 to 2003, the gross, sorry, the market cap as a percentage of the gross national product of the U.S. economy, that's his favorite ratio that he's been quoted many times. Is if he had to only look at one, as his favorite one. And uh, back in the dot-com period, it, it approached 200%. It was around 192%, I think it was this week. Today, as we, you know, or sorry, it's down. Five weeks ago, uh, that ratio was over 200%. So basically it was around 210%. And as of today, it would be likely around 220% if we just fast forwarded from early June. So we are in nosebleed territories and valuations. There's just simply no other way of putting it. Um, and, you know, if Buffett's indicator, which he states is a, you know, more of a current valuations indicator versus a market timing indicator, um, you know, just know where you are at in the market cycle. And that indicator would clearly demonstrate that we are at, at valuations that are in those big uh, territories. And, and a big part of that has been because of the technique we mentioned earlier. Now, there's also um, an analog uh, graph uh, uh, used a couple days ago, which, Leon, you can circulate because I've sent you the presentation deck of uh, a few days ago. But in there, what that same ratio does as a long-term 10-year forecasting ratio um, is projecting basically a negative 6% rate, 6 rate of return out of the U.S. equity market going into the next day. That's, um, that's sobering. So, um, you, know, it, you know, things don't go in a straight line. They never do. But uh, that is, you know, coming back to my earlier comment, you can have great companies, but if you overpay for them, you can have a very disappointing outcome uh, from a perspective of uh, you know, the investor's shoes. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Um, great question. I have another question here, and it was funny because I was going to ask you this as well. They asked me to, to, to ask you. It's around the election coming up, and two things. One was talk in the US, Biden winning the election and the impact on the market. But what wasn't also asked in this question is, how important is Biden's selection for VP? And will that have an immediate impact on the market as well? Great question, Zed. It's, it's going to start to come in more and more into focus here over the next 60 days as we start to approach the November uh, election. Um, so, there's a, there's a site called Predict It, uh, which is kind of like a gaming prediction site, obviously. Um, and they're showing right now a 20% spread uh, on, on uh, you know, Biden winning as, as the president. 
who knows, uh, you know, I'm sure that'll tighten as, as the results come in in November, but, you know, for the, for the most part, um, this is, this is particularly challenging because you got the presidential race, you've got the house and the Congress, uh, and how it'll shift. Uh, in our viewpoint, there's definitely going to be a, a stronger shift towards Democrats across the board. Um, and that's, you know, Biden's already outlined some of his uh, stimulus packages and, and you know, renewable energy, for example, been one thing that he's just rolled out here in the last week uh, that he'd set up uh, you know, a $2 trillion uh, package towards that. But he'd also increase corporate tax rates and, and uh, likely some, some additional uh, taxes on the you know, wealthy. So, I, I, I mean... I'm living here in the U.S. Um, I've spent about seven years of my life in the U.S., three for career-wise and four for university. And, uh, you know, it shocks me, candidly, that, you know, the two leading candidates for president for this next go, uh, the U.S. couldn't have, you know, a better set of uh, options. And, and, I, and I, I, you know, I'm saying that as a fellow Canadian, it's sad to kind of see. I've met uh, Joe Biden before, uh, more like about 10 years ago. He was sharper, um, you know, very thoughtful. Um, if I could vote, because I'm on a working visa right now, if I could vote, um, you know, I think I would vote for him. But uh, clearly there's some um, concerns around his mental acuity. So, you know, Leon, your question around who his VP is going to be, I think the markets are going to react to that. And I think we're going to find that out here in the next six days uh, as to uh, how people view it. Because, you know, quite candidly, whoever whoever's picked as VP could very well be uh, an acting you know, president in the United States, uh, you know, the largest, most important country in the world. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be interesting is all I can really comment about that. Another trigger point, potentially. Yep, yep. Uh, Michael, Kalpin, you want to come off? I, you got a question here about inflation. I know we sort of touched on it, but maybe you want to elaborate a little bit more. Are you? Do I still have you on here? Okay, maybe not. I'll just read this question then. It comes back to inflation if it's going to bite us due to government sti stimulus driving increases in money supply. And we talked about effective hedges. Uh, we talked gold quickly, but is real estate one? And then somebody else actually asked, Tony asked the question is, is the equity market seem the most inf effective inflation hedge today? Hmm. Well, that's a multi-layered question. And I'll let John maybe take a swing at that as well after I'm done with it. Um, <laughs> uh, real assets, hard assets, such as real estate long-term has been a very good inflation hedge over time. Uh, I guess my concern about wholeheartedly suggesting at this point is, you know, what type of real estate? Uh, you know, there's many different types. And I would say that uh, you know, during uh, one graph from my presentation, in which uh, you have, uh, talk about, you know, data centers, for example, have been up uh, during this whole COVID situation. Uh, obviously, retail malls, um, you know, shopping centers, things like that have been hit really hard during this period of time. So, you know, it really depends on the type of real estate, I guess, would be the simplest answer to that. Um, things like tips, which are inflation, um, treasury participation, uh, trading units, uh, uh, would be something that could assist you. Commodities, historically, have been a very good inflation edge. Commodities today, as a broader set, um, well, you know, it started to rally here in the last three months, but basically up until three months ago, commodities were the cheapest that they've ever been vis-a-vis -vis the stock market in the last 50 years. So again, if, you're, if your viewpoint is from a three to five year plus investment time frame, I think commodities are an area that I, uh, are under owned by most investors and should be owned at this point, uh, looking out. Um, I think personally, you know, given the amount of money that's been printed, the amount of deficits that have been added to, I mean, 
you know, the last two weeks, Canada's announced you know, RBC's projection is $250 billion. And, you know, the finance minister announced, uh, you know, $343 billion deficit. And just to put that in context, pro rata vis-a-vis the U.S., that is a 65% higher level of deficit this year for Canada on a pro rata basis than the United States. And, you know, we're not the reserve currency in Canada, right? So I, I would suspect that, you know, the debt bubble, uh, which has been accumulated over the last 12 years corporately uh, through share buybacks and just debt issuance by governments, by provinces, and quite candidly by households, at some point is going to create a significant dislocation in Canada. Um, so distressed strategies, you know, whether private equity or credit or you know, different opportunity sets around distressed investments. I think for, you know, very sharp investors, I think there's some areas there that you can make some very good money on here going ahead the next two or three years. So you know, back to the earlier comment about cash, um, this is one of those periods of time in which doing nothing or doing less and you know, tapping into your patience level here over the course of the next, you know, from an investor point of view, over the next uh, 18, 24 months is probably going to be the prudent choice. Because this is, I think there's going to be uh, some significant distress coming in the overall equity and fixed income markets. And in fact, the high yield market right now, um, you know, which are you know, higher yielding bonds, corporate bonds in, in the U.S., um, you know, they're, they're far less covenant, they're covenant light these days. Um, I think there's a really uh, strong possibility of, of some significant defaults. We saw that with Hertz. We'll see that. I, I think there's going to be a wave of defaults for the next 24 months as we kind of, you know, see the economy adjust to this. So it's, uh, yeah, it's going to be a challenging period. But John, what, what do you think? Oh, you know, I, I, I agree with a lot of that. Uh, and, you know, I guess a couple of things I would just layer on is that <clears throat> when you mentioned real estate, because I, I really do believe, as you say, <clears throat> depends on what type of real estate, because often a lot of real estate valuations are based off of the level of interest rates and affordability. So, you know, that <clears throat> it creates challenges in a lot of parts of real estate, but opportunities in some areas where you're, as you mentioned, like data centers. And then further to that on, you know, leverage. I mean, when you look back, you know, you clearly, you know, Athena, because he's mentioned a few references to, you know, long historical periods. I mean, periods of high leverage can be sort of deflationary forces because, you know, there's not enough discretionary income, whether it's corporate or individual, for the ability to raise prices generally. And uh, so that's an interesting dynamic. And the other thing is, you know, periods of sustained high inflation typically have wage inflation associated uh, with them. Certainly we've not seen that, you know, wage is adjusted for inflation have been kind of flat for uh, quite a while now. So to the extent that inflation would actually carry through to wage inflation is what I think would create the real inflationary uh, pressures. And uh, so, you know, they mentioned commodities, gold, I think within equities, you really, it would be fairly segmented. You'd have to look for companies, industries that actually have the ability to sustain and raise prices in what may be a, you know, long, slow economic recovery, as was, as was talked about uh, earlier. Uh, we've seen, you know, sort of the stay-at-home beneficiaries having some, you know, some, uh, you know, food retail, uh, food producers, uh, you know, paper products, you know, some obvious candidates in the last while. I think, you know, they're determining who actually has the ability to sustain and raise prices over the next couple of years in a kind of volatile, uncertain, you know, slowly recovering economic environment. That's, uh, that, that could potentially be the inflation hedge. And maybe the last thing I'd just put on is, uh, you know, it's not so much inflation hedge, but I, I'm looking at the low, absolute low level of interest rates today, record lows essentially uh, here. And in many cases, if you look at you know, like dividend stocks, which have been disproportionately actually beaten up relative to the market, if you believe and if you can find companies where you feel they can sustain their dividend through here, that could be an interesting 
uh, area to be looking at because you know you have an almost record spread between yield, you know, dividend yields and low interest rates. If, rate, if interest rates stay low, and you know, obviously we've seen some companies, certain banks like Wells Fargo in the U.S. have to cut their dividends. But if companies that can sustain their dividends, that could be an interesting area. Uh, well, John, that, just you, you bring that up, and uh, maybe Canadian banks. I mean, they've been great on the dividends. Nobody's rolled anything back today. They haven't bounced back very much. Are, are you guys looking at Canadian? What's your perspective on Canadian banks today? Well, it, you know, that that's a really interesting area. I mean, typically, you know, I guess our view is you, you look at banks when they're actually, you know, sold off and cheap. Uh, you know, Canadian banks are, are a bit unique and they tend to trade at a premium on a few valuation metrics. Uh, you know, if you look uh, like at things like, you know, price to book or or cash flow, they tend to trade at a premium relative to banks in other countries because we have a you know pretty solid, stable foundation here, and it's really oligopolistic uh, territory um, or uh, oligopolistic market. Um, so they clearly are more interesting. There's there's obviously some headwinds if you think that, for instance, real estate will not be as you know robust or will be flat over the next few years because it was such a strong backdrop for them over the last decade plus. Um, the valuations are more interesting. You know, they have strong capital structures. You know, they have decent dividend yields. So I think it's an interesting group. They clearly have lag, though. I mean, uh, you know, when I was looking at some data on the Canadian market, and, and banks have actually a, a big reason for this. I mean, from the bottom, you know, Thane gave some data earlier, but from the bottom of the Canadian market, you know, the average stock is up uh, 53%. Um, gold, software in Canada, small industry, software are big drivers of that. But, you know, the, yeah. S the index itself is only up 38. And the, the holdback is, has been the banks. Like they have been underperformers because of the perception that if this is going to be a challenge, more challenging economic recovery, you know, their earnings power is not going to be as good over the next while. But remember, I go back to strong capital bases, you know, oligopolistic structure, you know, decent yields, interesting valuations now. And I'll you know, come back to you because on the Canadian banks, you've been, I, I, you've had different opinions, but they've taken such large loan provisions right now. In the yeah, last, I love them. So again, does that loan provision for those that don't, it basically <clears throat> anticipates all the write-offs and the bankruptcies coming. So they've taken the hit today. What's your perspective now on the banks? Yeah. So, um, my per personal view is the Canadian banks will probably go 20 to 40 percent lower from here over the course of the next 12 months, 12 to 18 months. So I, I would be less positive. Part of the reason for that is, you know, just to give you some comparables, uh, 20 percent of Canadian mortgages today uh, held on the bank's balance sheets are um, in deferred mode. Uh, compare that to the U.S. is roughly 8 percent. So, uh, you know, this COVID you know, and all the government programs is, 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 we're kind of in this wait and see mode because of that. And, and the program in Canada has been extended to the end of the year. So I, I still believe there's another shoe to drop. There has been roughly $11 billion in provisions, uh, loan loss provisions set aside by the Canadian banks, uh, most recently, uh, in, in the latest quarter. Um, the, you know, if I look, Back to 2007 to 2010, during that period of time, Canadian banks on average went down almost 60% from peak to low, um, and then you know, obviously rallied off the low point. This scenario to me seems way worse, and yet the Canadian banks during this period of time dropped only 44% from peak to low and, and have rallied roughly 33%. So as John mentioned, has rallied, but not as you know as much as uh, uh, other sectors. So, uh, Canadian banks, in my opinion, have some more pain to come. I don't think the provisions taken most recently are going to be it. I think there's going to be more, from what I'm hearing from different sources. Um, so, you know, Canadians love their Canadian banks, and uh, you know, I, I've made a lot of money in Canadian banks over time. But I would say. Um, you know, I still think there's some more pain to come there. A couple other points just maybe to add, because, um, you know, uh, Leon, you asked earlier about private equity. So private equity and venture capital, I didn't really touch too much upon. Those areas 
the vintages of private equities, uh, private equity funds, or venture capital funds today, uh, raising money for the you know the, the, those uh, really good operators that can raise capital today, and put the money to work over the course of the next two years. I think today's vintages are going to be extremely good in performance because again, I think they're going to be able to buy or sift through and see some uh, some really good opportunities in, in repricing and lower pricing on a lot of different things. And that's indicatively what, I, what we're hearing across the board. And then secondly, I guess the other comment, I, the analog I would point to is what, what can happen, and I'm not suggesting it's going to happen in North America, but is Japan. Japan, you know, um, got super over levered in the late 80s on real estate. Um, and basically their financials got hit the following two years in 1991 as a recession kind of took place. Um, and literally their, their banking system almost collapsed, uh, was down around 85 to 90% during that period. And they've had this cascading, uh, 30 year, um, uh, in essence, challenging period. So they've had trading rallies and it's been opportunities, but, um, you know, there's an example of a system that was highly over leveraged and how debt tends to put a significant cap on uh, potential growth. So, you know, so many of the people on, on this call today are business owners. So I guess what I would say to you is if you have a business that is still uh, strongly growing in this environment, um, I would, you know, seriously take a look at monetizing at least some of my business holdings here over the next year or two. The reason why I say that is a lot of private equity is going to be looking for companies that are still growing in an extremely tough market environment like this. So, um, so again, there's going to be opportunities on, on in, in different sectors and whatnot, but that's just some additional things I'd add. That's great. Thanks, Nate. I, I just, I know we passed 12 o'clock. I put a note out there that we may extend this for another five minutes. If you have to leave, we are recording the session. Thane, at, come back to asset allocation. You're dealing with a lot of very high net worth, some ultra high net worth families. What's the asset allocation look like for these people right now? Yeah, so yeah. Higher, ca higher cash than normal, probably 17 to 22%. Um, Business holdings, they tend to still own, you know, private businesses, probably another 30%. Um, fixed income, they really don't like bonds here for the most part. Um, and this will be, you know, fairly consistent with the Tiger 21 asset allocation uh, research, you know, that you get. Um, equities, public market equities, you know, they're, you know, 20 to 30% depends on the industry that they're in. Um, some higher if there's a concentrated uh, position. Um, and then, you know, on the real estate side, they tend to be you know, anywhere between 20 and 30% depends on uh, where they're at. And that's inclusive of their you know, principal residences. So, you know, they, they tend to be more spread out. Um, and it reminds me of the old phrase, uh, concentration of resources or wealth tends to create wealth, i.e. through a business, uh, I through I uh, through the concentrated stock position, but keeping it uh, basically requires a lot of diversification to high quality assets. So today they're 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 spread out quite well. Um, and for you know some of our clients, we've actually been adding here this week. Actually, this week we've been adding some short or long short type strategies to the portfolios um, to be able to try to make money if and when the markets decline uh, through different, you know, shortening or, or uh, uh, negative scenarios. So we're in our, in our way of advising clients right now, we're uh, probably hard defensive here at this point juncture as we speak here today. So um, diversif diversification is critical and um, you know, again, trying to make sure that from a balance sheet point of view, um, you know, the amount of debt and leverage is more than manageable at this point in the cycle. 
I think that was very helpful. I, again, one of the reasons I, I sort of wanted to, to have you and John on, on the call today is I am really worried about how our, you know, we, we spend so much time in our operating businesses. Companies are fantastic at keeping our minds occupied, working yep. 70, 80 hours a week into the business. So we have very little time to think about the wealth that we're actually creating and, and taking care of that as well. And you spend so much energy building that wealth um, that we may lose sight of it. And I want to make sure these people actually preserve their capital. So understanding a little bit of that asset allocation is really yeah. important. I would also add one other thing, Leon, and you, you know, you and I have known each other for about a decade now. Most entrepreneurs that I know, they're really passionate about their business. They're not really passionate about the markets. But in fact, I, I, I think that they view the markets in some ways as a necessary evil. All right, it provides some diversification, some, some liquidity, but they really don't like it. Um, or if they do, it's kind of a neutral attitude towards it. What they're really passionate about is the business. And uh, at the end of the day, that's how most wealth creation occurs is through you know, an individual business today. So um, I just want to kind of add that little tidbit. No, I think that's, that's, that's really important. The other thing, as I conclude the call, I mean, what's, what's really obvious to me in listening both to you and John here is the complexity. In good times, it's almost easy to be an investor. When times are like this and there's so much uncertainty, I almost think you got to be crazy to try and do it alone. Like you can buy public companies, but when you start talking about all these other alternative investment tips, all I mean, who's got the time to really think about it? Like you're at such a disadvantage. So uh, thank you, Thane, for, for joining us today. John, thank you for your feedback as well. Uh, uh, my my um, pleasure. Thank you for hosting me on. Yeah, no, really great session. Uh, and thank you all for uh, joining us today as well. And if you're interested in any further The Way Forward live webcast, please visit us at po-leadership.com. You'll find we have a number of recorded uh, webcasts that we've done over the last four months that include Professor Janice Stein, one of the founders of the Monk Institute, a professor at U of T. Uh, we've got Rosabeth Cantor, Professor Michael Beer, both professors at Harvard, Joe Jackman and Stefan Reed of Jackman Reinvents talked with us two weeks ago. And Harry Kramer, the former CEO of Baxter International, was on with us a, a number of weeks ago as well with your 168. Just phenomenal. We have a big session coming up in a couple of weeks that I am going to do personally. I'm actually getting JP Paluth Fry, who's probably one of the top leadership experts when it comes to EI, and really talking that the conversations there is going to focus around how a crisis separates great leadership from the rest of the pack. And I think we got a lot of changes coming in the next six to 12 months. Anyway, on behalf of us all, thank you, Thane. Thank you, John, for contributing as well. Um, I wish you all a fantastic rest of the day and have a wonderful weekend. That concludes our session for today. Thanks, everybody. I know.